um, I've been in the industry for a very long time, to over 26 years. I've worked on all kinds of game franchises from, I mean, I was at Microsoft for 13 years, so I worked on like all the Age of Empires and Halo and Fable and Forza and all that stuff. And since I've left Microsoft, I've worked on all kinds of other things as well, um, like all the Bioware games since Jade Empire and on and on it goes. Um, but um, what, the way I want to start this out is essentially, because um, in my later career, as I, in the last 10 years or so, I've gotten more involved in advocacy work in the industry, because I've been around you folks so long, that I, and I love you so much, honestly, and I love what you do, because I'm just a geographer, okay? I technically don't even belong in this industry, so I kind of found a way to stay here. Um, finagled my way into doing culturalization work for game developers, so that's why I've been around so long. Um, but I r really admire everything that you do, and I hate when you get mistreated, and I hate when companies treat you poorly, or when publishers uh, treat you like crap. And um, that's the reason I took the IHDA job several years ago and ran the organization for five years. And that's why I continue to speak out about various issues in the industry, even, I've, even though I've left two and a half years ago, um, because it's important to me. Um, so I want to start by reading a letter. It was an email I got late last year from a student in Europe. Uh, and th I thought this letter really exemplifies a lot of the contact I hear from a lot of students around the world. Um, and so let me just, just go through and read this. So, uh, dear Ms. Edwards, last year I attended one of your lectures at our school and you inspired me as a young woman going into the game industry. It's great to see a woman like you advocating for our rights and doing the things you do. Now, as you may have heard in September and October, multiple controversies in our industry came up and this is what I'm emailing you about. Within our school, we have a Slack channel that we use to discuss things that are going on in the industry right now. Recently, the incidents at Telltale Games and Rockstar Games came up, and we've gone into a lot of discussion about this and about what we need to do within our school teams to minimize this behavior. In this Slack channel, I see a lot of, we need to unionize the gaming industry messages, and I see a lot of, we need to, to get out of this mindset. Um, but it doesn't give me anything I feel that any of us could possibly work with. They're just words. But to be honest with you, these incidents worry me. I'm concerned that when I come out of university, I will be forced to work as many hours crunching as you see in these incidents. After all, these stories are not at all uncommon. I fear that while I love video games and I'm passionate about creating them, I will no longer be able to see my loved ones and I'll be forced to work at a company that enforces ridiculous working habits as part of their, quote, culture. As mentioned, we've discussed a lot at our school about what we could do, but I'd like to ask you, what can we, the students of today and the developers of tomorrow, do against these practices? What are the ways that we could prevent this from happening? After all, we are, are the next generation of this industry. Is there anything that we can do? Right now, I am mainly afraid of what future awaits me. So that's typical of the kind of message I get uh, very frequently from a lot of people around the world. That's not the kind of message we should be hearing from the future talent of the industry. Um, it really aggravates me when we have that perception. So then we have to ask ourselves, well, what can she do about this? Um, but more importantly, what can you do? And, and most importantly, what can we do? Because this is not just a one person's problem, obviously. So, um, as I said, I've been around this industry for a long time. I've had the opportunity to speak at a lot of events around the world. That's, yeah, Comic-Con. Um, and in that, I've gained a certain perspective that I think is fairly rare because I've talked with virtually every kind of person that's in this industry from the garage indie um, in an emerging market to massive AAA to government officials to trade associations, all of those people in between. And I've been able to get a certain kind of perspective on, on what I see going on in, in this industry. And what's really clear to me in talking to game creators all around the world is what do they actually want? And over and over and over again, I keep hearing the sentiment that they want a sense of leverage. And what do they mean by leverage? Well, technically what they want is some ability to push back against things that they don't like that are happening to them, whether it's a publisher treating them like shit 
or whether it's an employer treating them unfairly or any other kind of incident that's going on, because right now there's a perception that as a game creator working for a company, you basically have no leverage whatsoever. You're basically at their whim because, of course, your passion is a commodity that they exploit. You say, I'm passionate about making games. Well, that's great. Then you're, you're willing to work 70-hour weeks because you're passionate. You know, and if you don't like that, that's fine because there's 25 people outside the door who will take your job in an instant. And that threat is often, you know, put over us. Um, when I ran the IGDA, we created a, what I call the developer satisfaction survey. And um, I'm not sure if you could read all of that, but that's okay, I'm gonna point it out. And so when we asked people, what would be a reason for leaving the game industry? And that largest one, the bar down at the bottom is I want a better quality of life. And so that, was, that came resoundingly out of the survey results. And then we asked, what are the reasons captures why you choose to be self-employed or, or be a contractor or freelance? And again, number one issue, number one reason is more control over working conditions. And the other ones that are up there as well is I want to make the games I want, uh, make the games I want to make and have more control over the content, which are answers that are also very consistent with artists, which is we all are artists at heart and, are, and all artists ultimately would love to make their own work. Um, we like working on other people's stuff too, but there's always a part of us that kind of has that idea that we would like to pursue. Um, we also asked if you feel there's equal treatment and opportunity for everyone in the game industry, and this is not a surprise answer to me, that uh, a lot of the people said no. Um, when we get to the opinions about unionization, because that's been a hot topic over the last couple of years, um, as I'm sure you all have seen, this has changed pretty dramatically over the last decade. So when we used to have, when I ran the IGDA, uh, I inherited what was called the Quality of Life Survey. And so in 2009, 32% of respondents said they would join a union today if, if one was formed. In 2014, um, that jumped up to 56%. And um, then 2017, there was a, a, a study done uh, in Quebec um, by researchers who are actually affiliated with the uh, IGDA survey. And um, their, own, their own survey showed that 66% were in favor of a local union, whereas a whopping 82% were in favor of an industry-wide game developers union. And then the GDC, they did their own survey earlier this year, right before GDC, and 73% said yes or maybe to a, uh, having a union. So um, it's interesting how this continues to skew in that direction. And, and, but I thought things were supposed to be getting better. I mean, aren't we becoming more aware and, and we're being more responsible as employers and employees and all that kind of thing? Apparently not. Um, and of course, you've, you've probably seen a lot of the press around this issue over the last couple of years. It's become a really a hot topic. It's been really engaged um, for a lot of reasons. I think one of the key reasons is because Game Workers Unite showed up at GDC 2018 and really forced the issue into the press. And I think that's great because we have had these conversations ever since I've been in the game industry. I mean, going back over 25 years, there's always been discussions about unions or some other form of leverage that can help us, but nothing has ever happened. Um, what we're really after, though, whether it's a union or some other entity, this is really what we're after is this idea of collective bargaining. So collective bargaining is essentially when a group of less powerful people get together and they basically decide that they're going to agree on a certain, like a, a work rate for a certain type of job, for example, or certain ways that you are engaged with, uh, with, the, uh, with the people or what benefits you might want in a job. And so you negotiate that with, with the more powerful entity, which is usually the employer. And um, this happens all around the world, of course. I mean, a lot of places in Europe, um, like last year, for example, I worked in the Netherlands for six months on a project. And so I said, well, what's, uh, let's negotiate my salary. And they said, well, no, it's already been collectively bargained and here's what your rate's going to be. Enjoy it. So you, you don't get to negotiate. Um, but there was a certain comfort in that. It's like, well, I don't have to worry about it. Um, but there are different forms of leverage that we can look at, and I want to talk about these very briefly. And these are all ways to have some form of collective bargaining occur. So the first is our guilds, and then we'll talk about unions, and then also legal defense fund. And then the last one I, is what I really want to stress is about public engagement. 
So a guild. So what exactly is a guild? Because And I know that some people throw this around, like we should form a guild, not a union. Or And a lot of people are like, I, what's the difference? Well, generally speaking, a guild is a collective bargaining entity for contract workers. It's for independent contractors, freelancers, people of that nature. And so um, the guild structure actually has been around for a very long time. It goes all the way back to ancient Rome. Um, this is an example of the plaques that you would see in medieval Europe when you would enter a city, and it would show you which kinds of guilds are in the city, like the barrel makers and the bakers and all the other people, uh, you know, the wheel makers, all that kind of stuff. And actually, if you see in a lot of cities today, if you drive into the city and they'll have like welcome to wherever, and they'll have like the little emblems of like the local social groups, like the Kiwanis Club and the Eagles and the Shriners and all that, that concept of posting up those signs came from this way back in the medieval times. Now, of course, we know in Hollywood there are a lot of guilds that exist. Um, some of these have kind of morphed into more of a union structure, but Screen Actors Guild is probably one better ones, you know, the Directors Guild of America. And these are ones because all of these people are essentially a form of, of contractor or freelancer that work for different studios. And so they have this organization that represents their interests and sets the rates for, for certain kinds of acting. And so that's essentially what a guild is. Now, a union, by contrast, is typically a collective bargaining organization for employees. So that's why when a union gets formed, typically the union gets formed at a specific company. It's, it, not, it doesn't always like have this union come in and form it from the outside. It's usually the employees at a specific company who band together and say, we're going to unionize. And then once they make that decision, a lot of times they decide to ally themselves with a larger existing union out there. Um, of course, unions have been around a long time as well, not as long as guilds, but for at least the last about 150 years, they have a long history, and of course, they're a very global thing. Even in places like, you know, peaceful Finland, they've got, they have unions there as well. Um, what's interesting about the union phenomenon, though, is that what we've seen, if you look at this chart, um, which I thought was really appropriate from the Economic Policy Institute, is that it shows that the wealth, the accumulation of wealth in the top 10% of society tends to increase when union membership decreases. So you can see here, this is from 1917 to 2014. So you can see when there was a huge increase in unionization activity back in the 1930s. I don't know what that is. Back in the 1930s and 40s, um, you could see how the income distribution became much more uh, down to parity. But now over the last several decades, union membership has declined sharply and you can kind of see what's happening as a result. And of course, we all hear the stories about the ridiculous accumulations of the 1% of wealth, or we see the stories about, you know, the studios who announce record earnings on the same day they lay off 700 people, you know, and give the CEO a raise the same day. Um, we also see, too, that when, with union in a, a workplace that has a union, there tends to be less of a gender wage gap. And you can see here the difference there. there. Unfortunately, it shows there still is a wage gap, which is a different issue that has to be addressed by the management. Um, but part of this makes sense because if you, when, if you have a you know, unionized job and it's been collectively bargained, basically that job type has a set rate. And so basically, regardless of who you are, you should be getting that rate. Um, and so there's a bit of an equalization effect going on uh, with the unions being there. Now, in the game industry, of course, we do have a couple unions that have been around. Um, game Makers of Finland has been around for quite a while. Um, not, many people don't know about it. Um, STJV started in France in 2017. And, um, but when it got started, a lot, some people noticed, but some people didn't because, you know, if it's Tuesday in France, you create a union. Um, it's a very common thing to do there. So, um, you know, but I'm, I'm glad that it exists. But of course, like I mentioned before, Game Workers Unite is really the force uh, in North America, especially that's been pushing the discussion and really forcing the discussion over the last couple of years. And as a result of that, you know, earlier this year, Game Workers Unite UK actually formed as a union. Um, they, they partnered with the Independent Workers Guild in the UK. So now they have the first game developers union in the UK. Um, so there is some movement around this, but I think a lot of people are watching to see, is there ever going to be a union in North America, especially in the United States, where the, the it, it is so political. I mean, it's just, well, a lot of things are now. But um, 
you know, it's, it's a really sensitive issue. Are we going to see one start there? My sense is that yes, eventually we will. Um, the other form of leverage that we can also look at is legal defense funds. So what would, what would a legal defense fund do? Um, essentially, it can provide access to legal counsel. So if you are an indie developer, for example, and you're like, we can't afford a lawyer, we need somebody to look at this contract before we sign it, you would have a place to go and get some, get some free pro bono advice from a lawyer. You know, they could tell you don't sign this or you whatever. Um, they help cover legal expenses as well, because one of the people, one of the things people don't often understand is when you have a lawyer working for you pro bono, that's only the lawyer's time. If you have to actually file a lawsuit or do any kind of legal action, that can cost thousands of dollars in legal fees and court fees and all the other things. So there is still a cost. Um, but one of the most important things is educating on labor laws and workers' rights, which is, is just the education process is really important because frankly, a lot of people who are in whatever province or state or wherever they are, the la there are labor laws on the books that protect you, but a lot of people don't know what they are and they never like find out before they take a job. And so if they find out a company's abusing their, their rights just from a basic labor standpoint, a lot of people don't call them out on it. Um, and if they want to, then they're afraid to because of, they're afraid of losing their job. Um, this is actually something that I'm trying to create right now. I call it the Game Creators Legal Defense Fund because personally, I think this is something that would be really useful to all kinds of people in the industry. Like a, for an indie who needs help with the publisher, um, if you're being sexually harassed at a AAA company, your management's, management is not doing anything about it, you'd have somewhere to go and get advice and, and um, you know, potentially have get some help and, and get through it. So, um, so that's another form of leverage. What's interesting in talking to some of my lawyer friends about this idea, especially around enforcing existing labor laws, they said, for example, just go after a couple of companies in the state of California. State of California has really good labor laws compared to a lot of other states in the U.S. And they said, just pick a couple of companies because they said, we know they violate these laws on a daily basis. You know, just go after them, take them to task, take them to court. You could settle out of court, but the point is that you drag them into court and you show them you're violating the law. And so hopefully the message is that other companies in that state and other jurisdictions will get the idea that, oh, there's actually leverage now. We actually should maybe clean up our act and treat our people like we should before we actually see a, a really serious lawsuit come down on us. And that's basically a lot of what, what I'm trying to aim for in my efforts is to basically fire that shot across the bow with the idealistic hope that they're going to change their behavior. That is idealistic. I think it's going to take more than just idealism. It will take legal action. Um, the other form of leverage I think is really, really important for us to do is, is public engagement. And so this is where we as game creators have to step up and actually decide who we want to be um, in terms of the public eye. Um, we need to view the public as more than just consumers of our games. Yeah, it's great when they buy our games because we could pay our bills and make other games and stuff. But we should enlist the public as an ally in, our, in ourselves around a cultural force that we are and around the economic force that we are. Um, you know, we all know that games make more money than film and music combined. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous how much money we make. Um, I don't think I included that chart in here, but it's like we even make more money than all forms of live sports around the world. If you take FIFA and NFL and all of that stuff, we still make more money than they do on an annual basis. It's a crazy amount of economic force we are. Not to mention the fact that games are the current evolution of human narrative. We are the ones who are defining how stories get transferred from one generation to another. You know, we have all these other forms of media that have happened in human history, writing, art, you know, language, all of these other things, and yes, those all still exist, but we are the current state of how stories get made and how they get transferred, and we should be damn proud of that. Um, that's because anytime I hear someone, you know, I would talk to them and say, well, I'm just a game developer. Slap. It's like, you're not just anything. You are this person on the forefront of human narrative, and that's no small thing. So we need to open up this black box of game development and game creation to the public because I really feel strongly that if we engage the public more, we can actually get them more on our side and kind of push back a little bit about the uh, you know the the backlash that we get as an industry from the from especially from the government sector. But let's look at this. So this is a basic ecosystem that exists anywhere in the world, a game development ecosystem where you have the game creators in whatever form they are, could be a 
a you know, bunch of indie developers, could be AAA, whatever. You have the game creators, you've got the government, you have education. So those three pieces typically form a, a healthy ecosystem. And it's healthy when all three of those are working together in a positive way. And of course, you have the game playing public as well. Those are all the, you know, that, which includes us. Um, the problem are, are these people, the non-playing public. They are the ones who often make judgments about what our art form is. They're the ones who see something out of context and have a knee-jerk reaction. So they go running to the government or they go running to the education system. You can't let your, don't use games in the classroom because they're evil. You know, you need to regulate this game because I saw something in it that really pissed me off or it made me scared. You know, all of that kind of dialogue going on. So that's going to continue to happen, but as we know, demographically, that group continues to shrink because the people who play games, it's basically ubiquitous today. Everyone in some form plays games, you know, in, in some way. And as, as the generation shift continues, um, you know, within a few years, well, a few years, I would say within 15 or 20 years, every politician on earth will have grown up with video games. Yay. So that'll be a, that'll be a great thing. Um, but... So the key, I think, of what we need to do is stop trying to engage the non-playing public, okay? It's just like, we, I know the ESA and other groups try and do that, and mainly they do that by engaging the government. And there is value in that. I'm not saying that's a worthless task. I mean, in the U.S., the ESA was responsible for securing the Supreme Court decision in 2011 that declared that games are free speech, protected under the First Amendment. That was a monumental uh, victory for the industry. But my point is that we as game creators, if we engage these people who are already playing our games, not just as consumers, but we're engaging them as fellow advocates of our art form and of our culture, it's like, why don't we have the public do their part as well to try and speak up and help us make this, you know, get out there with the message. But it's not just on them, it's also on us. Because one of the things I've seen so often around the world, when I talk to government officials and they said, well, yeah, we like, we're interested interested in the game sector, but like when we do public hearings about a certain law about video games or about a certain policy we might enact, the game developers never show up. They're not the ones who show up in the room to state their case, where if we have a law about fishing or forestry or something like that, the room is packed with people from that industry. The, the fishermen and the foresters and all those people, they're in the room to defend their jobs, but the game developers aren't. That's on us. We're the ones who need to step up and do that if we're proud of what we do. And I think we are proud of what we do. So what I'm trying to help avoid is this, this issue about, I don't want to see this, another note like this where someone is afraid to enter the industry. They're in that conflict zone where they, they love games and they have that passion and yet they just, they're like, but there's so much stuff going on. I'm really afraid uh, of what's going to happen. Um, another thing we want to consider is the idea of ethical sourcing or ethical production. Maybe this is a, an idea um, that we can push with people in the consumer area. Um, you, we know it works for like Nike sneakers and coffee and things like that. Um, but we also know from studies that ethical sourcing, um, a lot of people, when you ask them, are, are you concerned about ethical sourcing? They will say very highly, absolutely. So a huge amount of people say, yes, I am. But then they find out through other research that at the point of purchase, no, they're going to go to Walmart and buy the, you know, the, they're going to buy the cheapest thing they can. So basically, it, when it comes to actually the purchasing, that's where your ethics kind of go out the door a little bit because it comes down to money. And so, um, but is there, is there a possibility that we can help game consumers, you know, say, well, you know what, I don't want to buy that Rockstar game because they crunched for 100 hours a week. Do they care about that? Some people do. I know people in our industry who said they're not buying the game or they're not going to engage that because of that, but are consumers going to think that way? I don't know. I'm just kind of throwing it out there as an idea. So are these forms of leverage going to prevent incompetent managers? No, because human history has not erased that. Um, is it going to prevent crunch? Not entirely because they're, because you'll look at incompetent managers. Um, <laughs> And then, you know, is it going to prevent layoffs? Of course not. It's not going to prevent another telltale from happening. But the main thing that it is going to do is basically it's going to buffer game creators against the effects. Because, for example, in the case of Telltale, which was one of, frankly, one of the most egregious 
shocking examples last year when you had a studio that everyone perceived as being not only critically and commercially successful, but you know they, they were just like, they were on a roll and for, they went from one week of existing into the next week didn't exist at all, laid off all those people, um, no severance whatsoever. They were even onboarding new people the week before the company closed. You know, it's insane. That should not be allowed to happen. Um, and so something needs to, to happen. And, and there, well, I stated that again. That's interesting. Um, anyway, so uh, I think my time is up at this point. But um, that's the message. Basically, if you want leverage, part of it is you have to fight for it. And the other part of it is I think we can get the people who enjoy our art form and our culture, that the culture changing thing that we are, we can help enlist, enlist their help in, in kind of pushing that message. So are there any questions? Thank you. My question uh, is surrounding uh, public engagement. Uh, I'm, as I'm sure a lot of the developers here have experienced, uh, our players can be extremely uh, negative yep. in their actions against developers and that sort of thing. Uh, what would you say is an effective way to go about combating that? That's a good question. You're talking to someone who endured two plus years of Gamergate hatred because I was running the IGDA and I spoke out against them. So I've got plenty of arrows in my back and elsewhere. Um, basically, to me, it's always about separating the constructive from the destructive. And it's like I would take any, in, any kind of feedback that's constructive. If you want to tell us what we're doing wrong constructively, don't just complain, don't just yell. But if you're going to be constructive, then we will absolutely listen. You know, we might even change things according to what you might be saying. But if you're just going to be vent anger, it's just like blah, blah, blah. I don't want to hear it. Um, and I know that's hard because it's like that's part of your community. It's your players. But I think we have a responsibility to push back a little bit at the risk of possibly losing toxic players who pay for our games. But to me, that's a risk I'm willing to take. It's like this one of the things I was just advising a company last week where they're like, well, we're going to make this change that's going to make the game much more inclusive and diverse, but we're afraid of what the community is going to say. It's like... That's what I say. I'm sorry. It's, like, it's to me as game, as creators, we have a right to create what we want to create. And it's like I love like when I was working on Mass Effect 2, I think I believe that was Mass Effect 2 where there was a perceived lesbian relationship and Singapore banned the game. And I know some players were complaining about it and I love on BioWare's official blog, they said if you don't like it, don't play the game. That's the way the world is. We don't want you playing the game if you, if you don't like that. And I mean, that kind of attitude, of course, not everyone can, has Bioware's position, um, you know, but I think we, we can do more to set the tone, you know? So I mean, obviously we don't want to just push people back for no good reason, but I think constantly reinforcing that it's about constructive feedback and being constructive and building each other up, you know, including our game, that's what we're aiming for. And anything other than that, it's like, it's just noise. Fantastic, thank you very much. Thanks. A little over here. Hi there. Hi. Um, tying your talk to Lindsay's a little bit, I was wondering how you uh, perceive the role of local and regional guilds or unions in an increasingly remote industry. That's a great question. I actually think that's that's super important because I mean, the the, one of the biggest and most important things we can do as game developers is we need to be attached to community, whether it's virtual or, or local or whatever it might be. As, as local as possible would be nice because I think there is a huge value in face-to-face -face interaction with each other. I mean, that's the reason why I took over the IGDA was not just to try and rebuild its role as an advocacy organization, was because I really believe in the community aspect of, of the work that we do because it is collaborative. It's really rare that we have the single raw rock star who does everything and does everything great. We do have those, but that's a rarity. Most games are made collaboratively, and we have to recognize that fact. And so the more you can do, um, I think that's important. Uh, just as a follow-up, um, 
in those sorts of situations, how would you counter employers looking to employ persons that don't have the protection of a local or regional union or guild? That's, yeah, because you know it's going to happen. And I think as remote work becomes more and more common, I think that's exactly the tactic that a lot of employers will do. It's like they'll try and fill in the gaps from countries or, or regions where that protection doesn't exist. And so um, a lot of times what's going to work is, is it sometimes works that way in Hollywood because they've had established unions for a while, so they kind of have got it down as where other workers in other areas, even if they're not affiliated with a union, can refuse the work say, well, you know, why don't you pick the people over there? And I, I know that's an easy thing to say. It's a very difficult thing to do because if you want to eat and you want to feed your family and, and you know, you want to survive, so it's really, it's, it is a difficult choice to make. So. Hi. Um, very fantastic talk. Thank Thanks. you for your time. So in the industry today, in the AAA and in the industry, we're all looking for a sense of security. And I don't want this talk to go to the background. That's why I would ask, what do you think, in your opinion, we could do today in order to start to change? So right now, I think one of the things that has to happen is, and this is one thing that I'm doing, is I'm starting at the student level. So um, I think students need to take a bigger stand um, because I know it's really, really difficult. This is where it gets super difficult for a student just to graduated, desperate to get a job, and they'll take any job they can, and, and I get it. But at the same time, um, I've been trying to encourage a lot of students that I mentor to push back. So it's like you ask the company about their working conditions, ask them about their diversity and inclusion efforts, and if you don't get the answer that you like, then walk away. It's because you don't want to work there, you know, and ask other people about the company culture. And if you find out things that are really disconcerting, then don't take the offer. And it's really hard. But I've known some students who decided to say no. They actually said no and walked away from the very first offer they had. And they said they felt really empowered by being able to say no. And they didn't feel so desperate. And of course, within a couple of months, they, they were able to find something else. Um, so one of the things I've asked, well, I suggested I was talking to some students in Europe late last year, and I said, well, you know what would be cool is what if the students, the future talent of the industry, wrote a manifesto declaring this is what we expect of the industry that we're going to be entering. And so they, there's, some of them actually took me up on it, so they're actually preparing that, and we're going to release that soon to have other students basically send a message to the industry that this is what we're expecting of you, um, you know, because we are the future of the industry. We will be sitting in your chairs, and so this is what we're, we want. Um, but as far as, that's great for students, but as far as we who are actually in the industry or we in an indie position, whatever you might be, um, I think a lot of it is just being more vocal about what you expect and being open about it. Because I think so much of the interactions that we have are out of desperation. Desperation to get the work, desperation to get the contract. Um, and I know a lot of people who are just afraid to raise their voice. And they're afraid to raise the issues that really matter to them. And I think, the, but the more they do it, the more each person does it, the companies get it. They understand. That's why, that's the whole reason why I suggested to students that you need to ask those hard questions. Because HR people in the interview process, they listen to that. And if they know those are the kinds of issues that incoming talent are asking about, then that actually has a, 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 an effect on company culture. Because if they find out that you know, they've got a bad reputation or they, you know, they're not doing enough to change their own culture and people know about it, that spreads like wildfire through people who are looking for work and through the student community. So they know that. But anyway, I could go on for a long time, but I think we're, we're done. Okay. Thank you.